just to, just to kick off, um, I mean, we, as I mentioned, we do have um, Richard Kirby, who's our um, event chair. Um, he is the chief executive officer of Birmingham Community Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust. Um, and he, well, I've known Richard for about the last um, 20 years or so when we both shared um, an interest in commissioning. Um, he went on and Second, obviously. Prices started from just £22 a month, all with award winning online security. Right, uh, thank you. Um, and 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 in a way, um, you know, I was a GP, continued in my work as a GP, and um, Richard progressed um, in a very marked way um, into into management and such like. We also have Professor Zoe Verko, who is um, presently the she's been a geriatrician at UHB uh, since about 2010, and um, has been introducing innovative services uh, for older people. Um, I've known Zoe for probably as long as that, maybe as, as a geriatrician who has dealt with some of my patients when I was still a practicing GP. Um, she um, has looked after and has developed um, quite a lot of systems for patients with complex needs. Um, and that has really helped um, quite a few uh, of my own patients from, from previous experience. Um, then we have Daniel Oom, who's uh, the chair for the for Birmingham and Solihull Mental Health NHS Foundation Trust. Um, she um, was previously a chair of Walsall Healthcare NHS Trust um, and, um, and also Health Watch Birmingham and Health Watch Solihull. Um, she was previously a chair at Dudley and Walsall Mental Health Trust. A partnership trust. Uh, Mustak Mirza, he's um, a governor of Birmingham and Solihull Mental Health NHS Foundation Trust. Um, he's passionate about mental health uh, and well-being and um, especially in the elderly. Um, hence, his, uh, he, he, he will talk with some experience um, uh, during this um, seminar. Um, we then have Benita Richard, who is um, Support and Development Manager at BVSC, um, who um, is 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 a, a key BVSC is a key voluntary sec, sector infrastructure organisation for Birmingham. Um, I think we might have had some problems with Benita joining the video. Benita, have you managed to join? On yeah, video? I'm on two different app appliances, so I can share my screen on one and talk on this. It's fine. Fantastic. Well done. Thank you very much. Um, one last thing, uh, obviously, um, when, um, right, there, will, there, there haven't been any questions um, set, uh, sent for this particular event. However, we do want to share your um, um, reactions. You can do so um, via the button at the extreme right hand of the um, screen at the bottom of the screen, uh, and and you can obviously show your appreciation or and 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 um, uh, otherwise for for most of the um, comments that are made. There is a chat function there also, which um, will be quite helpful if you have any particular comments to make. And sometimes the chat function uh, develops into a very open discussion, as we've had recently at another event last week. Um, but anyway, that's enough of me. We've got 47 participants by the looks of it. And I think we shall be um, um, hopefully having some good interactions there. Um, I'll pass over to Richard now, and uh, we will obviously take it from there and uh, hopefully have a good discussion uh, throughout the um, evening. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Thank you very much, Peter, for your introduction and good evening, um, everybody. It's a pleasure to join you um, this evening for what, what I hope will be a, um, a kind of lively and, and um, informative uh, session. I will do my best to kind of chair it in a way that enables everyone to um, have their say and, and, and offer their views. Um, 
it, by way of uh, explanation of the format, we'll invite a couple of our um, guests to to share their thoughts in in sort of ten minutes and, and not more. So we'll do Zoe and Danielle first. Then we'll have a bit of um, discussion about what they've said. Then Mustak and Benita um, will have a chance to to share what they want to share, and then we'll have some more discussion. And we'll see at the end if we can pull out the kind of themes and ideas that we've um, talked about. Just, I mean, by way of, I guess, a couple of thoughts from me to start. It, it strikes me if you live in Birmingham, there are probably two things you've said at some point, um, and probably more than once in your life. One is that Birmingham has more canals than Venice, and the second is that Birmingham is the youngest city in Europe. And, and you might ask why a... Uh, you know, institution like the Lunar Society is devoting a discussion to ageing well in the youngest city um, in Europe. But it seems to me, and, and I suspect to all of you, as if it's actually a really important issue for us to be uh, thinking hard about and advancing the discussion about, partly because the um, older people within the city are the, the part of the population rising fastest. Um, those of us who aren't already you know, older people wanting to age well in Birmingham hope to be so one day. So this is, you know, something that matters to us all. And um, as I understand it, all of the evidence about the health and well-being in later life says there are lots of things we can do to ensure people live healthy and happy and independent, um, independently in, in old age. And getting that right is um, seems to be really important for us. It's also, I think, the case that we do that work in a city which is one of the most um, diverse in the country. So, you know, there are a set of issues about ageing as it relates to people in different communities and people different um, faiths and different beliefs that we may touch on. Um, it's a city like most big cities, which has some extremes of poverty and wealth and some issues of equality and inequality. And, and you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought those to the fore. And we may touch on how some of those affect um, older people and and issues of community and building communities and sustaining communities um, are bring a particular um, set of challenges in big cities and big cities and people in big cities find ways of rising to those challenges but I think there are some things about aging well in big cities that are um, perhaps kind of distinct issues and, and maybe they will come out as we um, as we talk so it's a real pleasure to, at this point, um, ask uh, Professor Zoe Worko to um, lead us off with, with her experiences, her perspectives and her thoughts um, on ageing well in Birmingham. So, Zoe. Thank you, Richard. And um, I must apologise to everybody for my slightly frazzled look. I'm, I have literally moved house two hours ago um, and I've just moved out of the fabulous city I've lived in for the past 25 years. So, um, so a, a a bit of a change um, and I'm also not on Wi-Fi I'm on a mobile network but it, the signal looks fine and we should be okay so um, uh, I would have I would have started with the Star Wars theme music if I could and those fabulous um, you know words rolling up the screen because once upon a time and actually not very long ago um, we didn't have a joined up system in Birmingham and it makes me so proud that I've been part of the team who've worked together to now say we do have a joined up system um, and the reason we weren't joined up was everybody said it was everybody else's fault. Um, and what we had was um, the care that somebody um, could receive uh, when, they, when they needed it, um, whether that was um, uh, social care, physical health, mental health, you know, whatever had caused them to uh, reach a point of, of crisis or, or chaos for them um, could depend on the day or time they needed to access that help. Um, it could depend on whereabouts in the city they lived, um, who on earth they, they first um, you know, made contact with. And, and they could either have a very good um, journey or a very, very poor journey, purely depending on variables that were really um, you know, outside, of, outside of their control. And then various changes within our local system across the different organisations and, and people changing roles and responsibilities. Um, actually led to some thought changes happening at a very senior level and, and lots of people, you know, just things, things were changing and everybody seemed to be coming to the same conclusions at around the same time. 
and it's always brilliant when you've got something like that because everybody thinks it was their idea and, and that's fine if it produces change then that's wonderful um, and, and the big change was well none of us are perfect so yes your bit isn't very good but our bit isn't very good either and when you're starting to actually hold that mirror up that's when you can start to produce change so we, at that point, and we're talking about three and a half years ago now, we had some external help and it was something called a diagnostic, just as a good way of describing um, what they were doing. And um, it led to um, people on the ground. So the actual teams looking after older people across um, social care, health in the different health organisations, primary care, community care, acute, actually looking into individual cases. So very, very person focused. So, so not looking at numbers, looking at people and, and the impact on people's lives and, and saying, well, what could have been done better here? Was this good? Was this bad? Uh, where could it have been done better? And from that, some themes came out. And, um, and those themes are actually what's led to, to where we are today. And it's what some of us, I think, knew anyway. But it was, it was just seeing that light bulb moment where, where people actually who you thought would know what was going on didn't but then you know you could just just see it happen and it was really wonderful and then we were actually helped by a cqc visit um cqc visits aren't normally uh, our favorite thing um but we had a system visit that looked at the pathway for older people and um, particularly in those with complex needs and when the cqc uh, came and did the thing that they call a summit where they give you your results um they actually said that birmingham was broken um, but then the really positive thing that they said was, but it appears that the team have got a way out of it. They're going to be able to fix this and they know what we're doing. So early intervention is the big thing that's, that's made a difference. And that's quite an odd name um, for a project. And there's early intervention in, in different things, but it's, it's sort of started and it's the name that, that, that's stuck. And there's various different components to it. Um, five projects. And those look at what happens if an older person hits the front door of acute care. So we have a team at our, um, at our acute hospitals that are based within the emergency department, but face outwards. And they're called the OPAL team. Stands for older persons assessment and liaison, but the only age limit is older than paediatrics and with needs that the team can help. So multidisciplinary uh, specialist nurses, physiotherapy, OT, social work, um, doctors of different grades. They then link into the community teams, EICT, again, not, not a catchy title, but really home first. So the same sort of multidisciplinary teams, but actually being able to work with people in their own homes to provide the care and the health care and support to allow somebody to recover in their own bed. And if you can recover in your own bed, in your own kitchen, in your own lounge, it's by far the best way to do it. Looking at the way we use the non-acute beds, so that you might not need to be in, in, a, in an acute hospital, but actually if you need some level of support that you can't be at home, how do we make sure that you're in that for the shortest time possible and that actually it's a genuinely supportive um, environment that enables you to get back to your own home and with the right level of support and care for you rather than going to institutions because we had a lot of people moving into to full-time care after that. We looked at what happened, um, so we're calling it the hub. So actually, um, the focus point, um, uh, you know, who's actually communicating between the teams. And um, I'm pleased to see Derek on the call. Um, so Derek, you don't need to get upset that I'm going to forget to mention mental health, um, because our fifth project was looking at um, uh, older people in the mental health beds and how do we make sure that we've got real parity of esteem there and that people who are in a mental health rather than physical health bed are still able to access all of those things that if they had a different illness would be available to them. So that was the five projects. And also backing that up, and I'm really pleased to see this is gonna to be touched on looking at um, neighborhood working as well and prevention. So how do we try and keep people as well as possible and, and stop them reaching that crisis point? And then for those with longer term needs, how do we make sure um, that that happens as well? We were going well, we had a plan, we knew how to do this. And then um, it hit March last year and the pandemic. And what that actually meant for us was where we thought we were going to try things slowly and, and try them out over you know, a matter of weeks and start in one part of the city um, and then roll out. We were doing it all together, all at once. Um, and that is you know, where the, the partners, um, particularly the Community Health Trust, 
um, local authority and everybody just all pulled together our commissioners as well to you know try and help the money flow around the system um, with a wry smile um, you know to, to enable us to do this but actually all working together all talking to each other all trusting our assessments we use the word trusted assessor which is a formal way of not having to get somebody to answer the same questions 20 times uh, during one episode of, of illness but actually that happens now my um, my front door team at the Queen Elizabeth spend more time talking more time talking to their colleagues in Birmingham Community Trust than they do colleagues actually within the acute hospital. And I think that's a really powerful thing. We have video calls. We know who each other are. We know what we look like, um, and it's really building those relationships and building that trust. We did this with buy-in from the teams. So we had the overarching aim. We knew where we needed to get to, but the teams on the ground have felt a real part of designing this all the way through, which is why it works. And they, if um, something's happened that doesn't work and, and they they thought it would work and it doesn't work, well, it's within their gift to change it as long as the outcomes, um, you know, it, it still does what it needs to. And, and those sort of, um, that sort of all. Um, and, and, you know, one of the pieces of feedback we get from, from the teams on the ground is that they're able to work in the ways that they want to, um, you know, and they didn't used to be able to do that. So I think that's my 10 minutes up. Um, I'm going to be quiet now, and I'm getting a, told my internet connection's unstable as well. So if I don't be quiet, I'll probably be forced to be quiet. Um, so, uh, Thank you for listening. I'm going to stay in for the whole call and um, I'm available for questions if, if needed. So thank you, Richard. Thank you very much, um, Zoe. And, and, and there's nothing like a kind of story to get us going. I had some, some comments about the importance of, of kind of the back door for back door of the hospital to people um, as we're going, some comments about partnership working and, and that I'm sure we will build on. Um, so now it's a pleasure to introduce um, Danielle Oon, Chair of Birmingham and Solihull Mental Health Trust, um, to share her perspective on ageing well in Birmingham. Okay, thank you. Um, I did send some slides across. I don't know if they can be shared. Oh, fantastic. That's great. Okay, excellent. So um, my name is Daniel Loom. I am the new chair of Birmingham and Sully Hall Mental Health Trust. And um, up until quite recently, I was chair of Health Watch for Birmingham and Surly Hall. So I'm absolutely delighted to be here participating in this conversation. And I've always wanted to see what goes on in the Lunar Society. Um, I'm especially thrilled to be sharing the platform with Zoe. I've been a big fan for a long time. I've seen you present at lots of events. Um, and really the sort of in innovative work that's been happening in Birmingham around this space uh, is something that I'm really glad to be part of the conversation. So um, I, um, a lot of my um, presentation is from the Health Watch perspective. And so um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Those are the things that I would like to discuss um, in my part of the presentation. So. Uh, healthcare system. We've heard about the innovation that's happening. We've heard about how a lot of that has been um, catalyzed and, and escalated, if you like, through the pandemic. But is it working for all? And um, where do we need to improve? Um, then I'd like to spend a bit of time talking about aging and health inequalities. And then particularly around the challenges of aging in Birmingham and what does that mean for us going forward? Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So um, it's very, very busy. I don't expect you to, to, to read it all, but essentially uh, these are stories um, that have been received by Healthwatch Birmingham um, over the last month or so. And the themes are elderly patients waiting outside um, for the vaccine, um, lack of uh, GP home visits for an elderly care patient and the, the struggles that they had to be able to access um, that support during the pandemic. Um, somebody else talking about um, the difficulties they experienced uh, in terms of the hospital discharge for their elderly aunt um, and the 
uh, the difficulty navigating the system, understanding um, the interface with social care and um, how to pay for things, uh, how to get support, understanding how to pay for care. Uh, and then um, uh, the do not resuscitate communication uh, and, and how people have found that they've got a DNR, DNAR without understanding how that's happened and the family being involved. So um, I think the slides will be made available afterwards if you want to read the stories in detail, but I just thought those are some of uh, a flavour of how despite all of the best efforts of partners working together, really pushing down organisational boundaries, um, you know, where things are sometimes still not going, going um, uh, as well as they could be for, for older adults in, in, in Birmingham. So, you know, we know that we're in unprecedented times. Older people are more vulnerable to COVID-19 mm -hmm. and services are overstretched. Uh, so despite the rapid transformation that has happened with all of the innovation that Zoe was describing, some of the long-standing challenges... Additional consultation, but Cola's father was recently diagnosed with diabetes. Some of the, um, some of the long-standing challenges that older adults have faced uh, have actually been exacerbated during the pandemic. Um, could we... Oh, that's great. The next slide, that's good. Um, so a few more themes uh, of, of issues and challenges that older adults have faced during the pandemic. Um, inequity in the availability of the flu vaccine. Um, people talking about uh, some, some, some parts of the system issuing the vaccine very readily, whereas other parts people have had to, to wait and not understanding why. Um, there's a very sad story about uh, a lady that was reporting lack of resources on hospital wards. Um, her husband had died sadly in hospital a couple of weeks ago. And whilst she was championing the care received by the patients, she felt the need to pay for some of the extras and to do some of the nursing herself while she was on the ward because things were so stretched. Um, another one, uh, caller was, was talking about their wife being discharged from hospital into a care home and not being kept informed about the treatment uh, and, and even having her uh, GP changed without any reference to, 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 to the family. And probably one that would resonate with quite a lot of us, um, the di difficulties that some older people face regarding the increasing move to digital consultations and, and information being presented digitally. And there's a story there about somebody being diagnosed with diabetes, but not able to access the information because it was only available online. So needing that support to understand how to manage a condition, but not being able to access it and not understanding where they could get the support to access it. So uh, as an STP, um, prior to the pandemic, you know, you heard from Zoe, there's been a significant programme of work aligning health and care partners to make um, health and social care work better for older people. But during the pandemic and, and post the pandemic, uh, as we now become a, an integrated care system, there will undoubtedly be even greater opportunities for joining up services. But in the meantime, there are clear signs of stresses and strains across the system. So um, could I have the next slide, please? Feel like Chris Whitty here. So um, we know that um, Marmot's um, update report on, on health inequalities underlined that without significant progress uh, to tackle health inequalities, meeting the acute service needs uh, will always be challenging. Um, when you add into the mix uh, health inequalities, uh, the wider determinants of health as, health as we call them, um, fuel poverty, debt, being socially isolated, all of these are massive contributors to people's health and well-being. Uh, we know that much of um, the demand for health care is, is uh, preventable and not all of those um, uh, challenges lie within the control of the health service. Um, but Despite the, the importance of working with partners across the system, there is also work that, that the health service needs to do um, in terms of its own areas of responsibility 
Um, so uh, uh, something called the inverse care law of variations in health service um, shows that in areas where there is a high level of um, socioeconomic disadvantage, quite often um, health services are, are um, less accessible and may even be of lower quality care. And that means that uh, in older age, the stage when in our lives when we most need good quality services, uh, our socioeconomic circumstances are going to be a significant factor in whether we receive the support that we need to age well. So it's absolutely essential to have a high performing healthcare system that looks after people when they get ill, um, but the holy grail must be preventing ill health and tackling health inequalities. So one quote from the Marmot report was, we need to move towards the social determinants and away from the overwhelming focus on individual behaviours. So this is not a mantra that's been adopted in some of the coverage we have of the pandemic, which has really focused on, you know, irresponsible flouters of lockdown rules and pitted the interests of one generation against another. Um, and so, you know, when we're looking at the, uh, the wider determinants of health for older adults, the focus may be less on education and employment, uh, more on addressing housing, uh, money advice, um, social isolation, digital exclusion, etc. So for partner organisations, working with the NHS can sometimes be challenging. Um, partnership working across, uh, across the NHS and also across sectors has historically been difficult for, for the NHS. Um, but as you've heard from Zoe, this is something that we've made massive strides on in, in Birmingham and Surly Hall. Uh, and this is now underpinned by national policy um, that's really explicitly moving the NHS away from competition and uh, towards greater collaboration. So that's only going to be helpful in creating opportunities for us to um, further improve um, the partnership working and uh, make the services even more joined up. Um, and beneficial for, for older people. Could I have um, the next slide, please? Thank you. So, um, as I mentioned before, digital exclusion, social isolation, uh, socioeconomic disadvantage, but also the trauma of lives lived through multiple recessions are some of the particular barriers to ageing well that people face in, in Birmingham. Um, so, 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 so many people um, who are reaching older, uh, older age at the moment, you know, will have been through recession in the 80s, will have been in recession again, and will have had a real impact uh, on their career prospects, uh, on, their, on their life earnings, um, that's actually, for many people, impossible to recover from. Uh, additional factors uh, include, um, and I'm not going to mention the young population because, uh, as Richard said, that that's uh, uh, we can take that as a given. But we know for uh, older adults, increasingly that is uh, a, a diverse population, and our services need to be able to respond to that. Mm -hmm. So I've got two quotes here from uh, Health Watch reports. Um, one, uh, and I've got the links there for people to read them as well. One of them was particularly about people's response um, uh, of their experiences during the COVID-19 um, wave one. Uh, and the other one is about the Somali community and their feedback about access to, to services. Uh, and in both of those are uh, people talking about uh, stigma, discrimination, um, and really feeling discouraged from uh, accessing services. Uh, uh, and particularly um, digital exclusion playing a, a, a big factor there. So the need for differentiated approaches, you know, Richard mentioned in his introduction, the need for the targeted campaign to address the take up uh, of the COVID-19 vaccine in different communities. And that is something that is being focused on um, uh, in, in Birmingham and Solihull. There's lots of really good work happening in that, in that area, but you know, we do need to keep going and make sure that the people who are most uh, likely to, to um, be hardest hit by COVID-19 actually do take up the vaccine. 
Uh, and in terms of, uh, of my trust, Birmingham and Solihull Mental Health Trust, clinicians are increase, increasingly considering the trauma of lives lived with the experience of racism as a factor contributing to the mental health of service users. So um, my final slide, thank you. Um, so it's not rocket science, but it is complex, but um, you know, in some ways it's straightforward because we already know what the challenges are. Um, so um, in terms of collaboration, working together, um, there's been many iterations of, of this uh, model. Some of you may remember local strategic partnerships, the total place concept. Um, we're now talking about integrated care partnerships and integrated care systems, but all of these are really about aligning resources and efforts in ways that really maximize um, uh, the opportunity um, to be really efficient, to be effective, and to be really relevant to the service needs of our local population. Um, the joining up, uh, the lowering of organisational boundaries so that teams in the front line can work with each other and have permission to tailor their approach to the needs of, uh, of, the, of the communities they serve is what um, uh, Zoe was talking about. Um, and uh, working with the voluntary sector organisations such as Health Watch, but other community organisations as well, is really important to ensure that we're hearing from older adults who are currently underserved um, by the health and, and, and care system. Uh, empowering, uh, genuinely devolving decision-making to frontline colleagues and also service users so that we can change the model from what's the matter with me to what matters to me. And, and then finally, we um, have got national policy um, backing up this approach, which obviously makes it easier. Um, the, the new NHS integrating care consultation paper is essentially a blueprint for all of this positive way of working that we need to do. Uh, and our task, I think, is to, um, to, to work with everybody to, to make sure that this is a, a really real and, um, and build on the successes so far. Thank you. Thank you um, very much, Danielle, for some really um, thought-provoking thought insights and some important reminders how this affects people when it doesn't work um, and, and that, that kind of after all is I think what we're kind of all um, seeking to do. Like you, you've already sparked a, a discussion in the chat about um, the, the impact of a tough life on your your kind of condition but when you reach older um, you know older age and, and, and the difference I guess between biological age and state of health and, and that um, I, I think is a big issue in many parts of our city. We'll take a bit of time to, to hear from some of those of you who, who are, um, uh, have joined us. Um, so we're very happy to, to take some comments or questions just, just briefly for a few minutes before we hear from our next two speakers. So is there anybody who'd um, like to come in? If, if so, and you, can, um, and you can manage the technology, put your, put your hand up and we'll... Um, so, Peter Mayer, I can see your hands up. Do you want to just make a quick point? You'll need to take yourself off mute though. Can you hear me now? I can, thank you. Very good, yes, I was just saying, there, there's a hand raised in the reaction box at the bottom of your screens. The, uh, we've been talking integration since 1948. I suppose what I'd like to know from everyone really, is why is it going to work this time? What are the changes that are happening that will make a much more seamless journey for people moving into the system now? Danielle, you began to touch a bit on that at the end, talking about integrated care systems and, and, and some of the, the system changes. So perhaps would you like to come in? I think um, having national policy behind it is very, very helpful. It, it means that we haven't got to try and work uh, against uh, a system of, 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 of funding and directives. That will be really helpful. Um, and um, 
you know, this is a, a, a government policy at, at, at the start uh, of a government term. So we've got quite a good run at it, I think. It's building on work that's already been um, in, in train, the Zoe set out for quite a long time, and now it's been reinforced by national policy. And the funding, um, certainly from the NHS point of view, will flow in a way that supports this way of working. So whilst we might feel as though we've heard it all before, and I, I, I listed quite a few initiatives that took us down this road, none of those actually involved the funding um, following um, this, 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 this model. So I think that's a massive change. Yeah, it, 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 it for me is, is moving from a focus on the individual and in, and in the policy, it's talking about looking at populations. But actually for me, if I go into hospital for something, that when I get out, I'm along a smooth pathway uh, and being elderly and difficult, uh, my problems cover a number of specialism areas. Uh, and at the moment, I, I'm not quite sure how they join up or a plan to join up with each other. I wonder, Zoe, if you'd perhaps like to just, just offer Peter a, a, a thought before I come to the ne next question. Um, yeah, it's how they join up. It, it's by, I, I think the conversations that we have increasingly different team members forget that they work for different organizations. And I think that's an important thing. And, and I, I, I was listening to something this week and said, you only need to do something different for 18 months because by that time, everybody has got this to be the new normal. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, D Danielle's examples pointed out how it still goes wrong, um, you know, and it does still go wrong. And, you know, I'm, I'm very realistic about that, but it's, it, it, it's right more. Um, it's how can we cement it um, as the, the way to do things. Um, the ICS, in a lot of places it's a white elephant but i think for birmingham and solihull actually we're very lucky because of the relatively small number of organizations involved and a group of people who've been working together in this way already for the last three years we made a decision so um manchester uh, got devo mank um got given all the money and told how to use it we didn't get given the money but we thought well actually let's pretend we've got it and let's get everything working together so if we do get the money we're actually in a really good place and you know talking to colleagues uh, working in Manchester we're so much better off in Birmingham because we just got on and did it um, I hope that's a touch reassuring for you Peter but yeah we're not there we're not there yet yes the third thing I might have said if you live in Birmingham at some point you'll say is that Birmingham's better than Manchester so um, thank you thank you Zoe for for that point um Mustak is there something you'd like to ask of, of Danielle or Zoe at this point yeah, thank you. I just uh, both of them touch on discharge policy, and I, I have a lot of people and been through it, and elderly people gone into hip replacement, and elderly people mostly they live alone, and if the environment are not right to come home, they go back in hospital, worse position there where when there was discharge. To me, if you say something. It's easier for me to react. I have got no patience, but taking that breather from responding to that space, like Fra Victor Frankl said, the responding, that's what we need to do, discharging environment, right? If the pet is there, everything set up, they can go back and live meaningful life at home. Yeah, it's a really powerful point. I can see Atif's hand is up as well. So perhaps I'll just ask Atif to come in and then I'll um, ask, ask Zoe and Danielle to um, reflect on what's been said. Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, uh, it's a quick point, really. Um, and, and it's not necessarily a, a around um, older patients, but um, I, I just wanted to make the point around that the Mushtaq um, alluded to around discharge being the, the, the main uh, an important thing, uh, you know, I've, I've got a disabled brother uh, who's got cerebral palsy, he's 30 years old, he was in hospital um, pre-pandemic, um, and the thing that was stopping him from going home after he'd had uh, a, a plaster put on his leg and injections put in, etc., uh, after an operation 
was that we didn't have an hospital style bed at home. Um, and, uh, you know, we refused the discharge uh, on, on grounds of safety. Um, and it took a, a, a lot of, you know, umming and ahhing. Uh, and we eventually got there. But uh, I agree with Mushtaq's point around it is so vital that the discharge and the work that the community healthcare do, I have to say, and I don't say this often about organizations uh, for the people who know me, is vital and so important. Uh, and uh, uh, and is just uh, the pandemic has proved how important your service is, Richard. And I, and I said I'd bring Danielle and, and Zoe in, but I can see Deirdre's hands up as well. So perhaps for this round, if I let Deirdre join in now, then we'll have a, a final thought from Danielle and Zoe, and then I'll come to our next two speakers. So, Deirdre. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, it was really kind of uh, connected into Atif's point from um, an inequalities perspective. And I wonder about um, pressures that are placed on organizations caring for older uh, people because we're not considering the inequalities that affect younger people from a socioeconomic, gender, ethnic perspective and dealing with those pressure points so that um, the issues don't become exacerbated in older life and taking some of the pressure off. And, and is that viable now? Thank you. So some points about discharge, some, some points about inequalities and tackling them at the right point in the life course. Um, so would you want to, to go first? Thank you. So I'll be very quick. So Mushtaq, you mentioned housing, which is something I don't think we are talking about this evening. Um, but in the chat, it's all about the, you know, determinants of health. Housing, you know, is, is such a huge issue when people's housing isn't able to meet their needs anymore. Um, and um, sorry, I think it was Atif, um, I, I've forgotten your name, who said about your brother and, uh, you know, unable to be discharged for lack of a hospital bed. This really emphasises the importance of having a joined up system where we're not counting the beans, you know, because your brother needed a hospital bed to get him home. So actually that, you know, should have just happened. Um, but it's when or one budget, that's on one budget, but actually in the grand scheme of things in financial cost of the system, but more importantly, quality um, you know, for, for your brother and you, that's how, the, you know, the money thing has to be about, it has to be person focused. And, and actually good care is cheaper than bad care because bad care can be really, really, really expensive. And actually to do it right just often makes sense. And if you're adding the numbers up is actually the best way of doing things. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Um, Danielle, do you want to offer a, a further thought? Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. I, I just wanted to say to Atif, I, 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 I really uh, admire you for um, the, the work that you must be putting in as a carer. I've got a cousin who's got cerebral palsy, so I, I do know um, what, what's involved in that. Um, in terms of um, housing, I do think that's absolutely vital. Um, so uh, in Walsall, I chair the main social housing provider, Walsall Housing Group. And um, the aim of taking on that role was really to, to bring housing and health together in the borough. Uh, and so Walsall Housing Group are um, a full uh, member of the local integrated care partnership in Walsall. Uh, and that's really come into its own in the pandemic. They've been able to refurbish facilities, create step down um, space so that uh, to free up uh, hospital beds um, uh, and to also create um, COVID secure space for people to, to recuperate outside the hospital um, and all other sorts of interactions that they've been involved in. So housing, absolutely vital, that connection between housing and health. Um, I think I wanted to just tackle the, the, the point that, that Deirdre had raised about um, working on health inequalities, working on equalities generally uh, and doing them earlier um, so that by the time people um, become older, uh, they're not carrying the trauma of, uh, uh, and the impacts of, of a life lived um, you know, uh, under inequalities. I think that, that's really important and obviously you know, as large agencies, 
Uh, we've got a role to play as anchor institutions. We can, um, we've got access to uh, employment opportunities within our own organisations. Um, we can work, as I said, with partners, with the voluntary sector, with housing, um, to open those up, to make sure that we're working uh, within local communities and responding. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot we can do that's over and above um, the very important job of providing uh, health and social care provision, but we can also um, contribute to the wider determinants of health as well. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, a really important point on which to kind of move to the next part of our session. So um, I am really pleased to be able to invite our next um, invited guest to, to share his experiences with us. So um, Mustak Mirza, a governor at Birmingham and Solihull Mental Health Trust. So um, Mustak, over to, over to you. Thank you, Richard. First, I'd like to thank Peter Myers. I'm honored to be invited to talk about aging well in Birmingham alongside, alongside the other distinguished guests. On this panel, my name is Mustak Meza, service the governor of Birmingham and Solihull Mental Health Foundation. I'm also expert by experience representing service user, recruitment staff, as a collectively, I have set up on a recovery college advisory group and have brought recovery college courses to service user, care and staff. I'm a part of Birmingham and Solihull CCG co-production in mental health. And I am involved in our PPG at my local doctor surgery. I'm also teach mental health awareness to student nurses across the West Midland University. Service user can contribute to the improvement of the service in four ways. We remind the service provider that our welfare is the focus of the services. We remind service provider that we are equal partner in promotion of holistic health service services we are to be work with, not on. We provide service provider with a valuable feedback about the effectiveness or otherwise intervention and approaches. We are the citizen of our tax, we are the citizen of our taxes, finance, the health service for the good of everyone. In recent COVID with the 19 pandemic has affected us all leading to increased isolation and anxiety. I have remained devoted in my own remind, remind devoted ambition to champion mental health in those, this time in initiated online conversion to recovery for all team of Birmingham Mental Health Trust. This foster positive discussion amongst our service user and care and staff. So a little bit about background about myself. I'm 65 years old, father of six, grandfather of eight. I have lived it in Birmingham for 52 years. I, I have been working since the age of 16 to support my family. I'm now thankfully retired. In 1994, I had reached crisis point and had serious mental health breakdown. I was diagnosed at the time with the psychotic depression. After, e after years of suffering, undiagnosed, in 2011, I was sole survivor out of four people in serious car accident in India. I was hospitalized for three months I found that both of these experiences actually showed me major health social needs that are required at this time, especially now during this pandemic. Many of the aging population may, may be alone, struggle with the issues similar of those what I have been through. We have set up urgent 24 seven mental health helpline with this 
CCG and Birmingham Solihull Mental Health Trust. This is all, this is so service user and those known to us can reach out if needed. This is a vital, the elderly as well. And not only to prevent isolation, but also their need can be identified and counseling guidance can be provided to improve their well being. We have also set spiritual guidance service to those individuals who have undergone bereavement through my GP practice in Sandon Road. I know firsthand this has helped many of the elder aging population. And this time, as they are no longer able to visit places, worship as they did before. This is especially important in South Asian community. As a member of Health Watch, Birmingham focus on the feedback concern about service in Birmingham. A lot of services such as the Health Watch have had to be physically stopped and moved online. A lot of elderly people, especially in the Asian community, don't have access, ability to use those online services. This is a physically, emotionally isolate to them. I'm also actively involved, a member of elderly resident of Hagley Village on Hagley Road. Many of the individuals that have been traumatized in recent event with this increasing anxiety come out from their, they can't come out from their rooms. I'm lucky that I can see my loved one in my own bubble but they can't. This is massively affected the mental health. It's so important to not forget the long lasting impact this pandemic, pandemic, pandemic will have on our aging population. And that, that, and what we can do aid them. I hope this talk such as like this one, using lived in experience such as mine will help transform, evolve physical, and mental health and our health and social care services. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Very powerful story there. And, and um, you know, just a kind of reminder of how um, important it is to hear directly from people who are um, using the services we're seeking to provide. So thank you very much. I'm sure there'll be lots from there people want to pick up as well as the discussion you've already stirred up in the in the chat about particularly digital inclusion um, and, and being kind of open about mental health challenges. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like now to introduce um, Benita Wishart, who's a support and development manager at Birmingham Voluntary Services Council to perhaps bring us um, into a bit of thinking about the role of community organisations and the voluntary sector in this um, agenda, which is something we've not touched a lot on yet this evening. So Benita, over to you. So we can see your slides. Um, if if you've started speaking, we can't we can't hear you. Ah, oh, sorry, that's fine. Technical problems. Lovely. So I'm Benita. I work. Um, have been working at BBSC for the last two years, supporting the city council in developing neighbourhood network schemes and also supporting them with um, prevention and community. Um, grant. So I want to talk about some of the work that colleagues in the room have been doing around aging better, around um, the neighbourhood network schemes, and also about the potential for moving forward to become an age-friendly city. I think the very first thing I want to, to, to mention is this that underpins all of the work that um, I'm going to be talking about, which is about the stats and about exactly what's been talked about which is all those other, other determinants of health and the fact that um, loneliness can be as damaging as smoking is quite powerful in terms of thinking about how we need to manage things. So the first thing to mention is Aging Better which is managed by BBSC but is a national lottery funded program. It was a six-year program and it's just been granted the seventh year because of the pandemic. 
and it's one of 14 across the city, across the country and it's very much a test and learn model so there's lots of um lots of uh learning resources and briefings on on the open better website um co-production is what um goes through a thread of everything that aging better does and there's examples of that thinking about the make someone stay initiative which was came out of the age of experience group the age experts by experience group and the campaigns group and it was a campaign it was about keeping in touch with people making the little things to, to talk to somebody or to phone somebody and have a conversation which of course has had to be adapted totally during the pandemic and also the uh, award-winning aging with pride campaign as well was developed with L the lgbt community and it's about making sure the visibility of older lgbt people in the community one of the key things of aging better is managing a micro fund and giving enabling small groups of people at a grassroots level who aren't constituted neighbors doing things with each other and enabling them to have funding and um, this is an example of a, a group of men that won and in the international walking football championship before lockdown but it came out of a story of a, a funeral meet a group of lads meeting at a funeral and realizing they hadn't seen each other and they missed each other but they needed a structure to be able to talk to meet together and so developing a walking football group through um, the aging better funding so aging better in the last six years has helped over nine thousand people it's been very reflective of the uh, uh, black and asian minority um, community in the city and it's had an impact positive impact on on people's lives so that but then the council wanted to learn from that work the council was keen to understand um, what had been developed there and also to think about how they could support social workers with the new approach to looking at whole people and um, what Daniel talked about really that strength based approach of what matters not um, what was it you said Danielle what matters not 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 what's the matter and that's yeah. the approach that social workers were being asked to, to work with and so the city council decided to introduce um, neighborhood network scheme support the prevention and first outcomes which includes some of the things we've been talking about are like around income maximization issues as we've been talking about about having decent income in households which helps um, address some of the issues and um, the issue about making sure that homes are safe and warm and and people can live independently at home but neighborhood network schemes are about looking at what's out there for the over 50 especially just for uh, older people um, or also for uh, community wider community use like community lunches that over 50s might be able to, to develop and i think that the whole also the key key point here is is to working with over 50 so it's not waiting until people are very elderly it's actually starting to get resilience in place at an earlier point in their lives so in each of the constituencies there's neighborhood network development workers or networkers that work um, with all the different community groups and faith groups in a, in a, in a constituency they they reach out to find out what's going on and they put it into an asset directory um, so people can find that information and then key they work closely with the social work teams so the social work teams know what they can help citizens connect to in their locality it's it's that point about prevention we don't call it early intervention it's a prevention how do we how do we has support people to not have to knock on the front door of adult social care it saves money but it's also have really helps their, their quality of life as well how can we get them supported in the community with all the fantastic things that the sector are doing and all of the information as you said is mapped in birmingham the city council decided to commission um organize third sector organizations to cover eight of the constituencies and uh, the neighborhood city council's neighborhood development support unit are managing two of those and they also manage small grant pots giving grants to community groups where they've been um, 
priorities met that need meeting, like we need something for older men or we need something for Bangladeshi women, etc. And this is an example before lockdown again of um, a grants workshop when some number of organisations that got funding in Erdington came together. Um, and one of the things it was also doing was capacity building them, helping them to think about how they could capture the positive things that were going to happen. In lockdown, the NNS teams in each constituency have managed to be the local coordination points um, for all the community-based activity that's been happening there and um, have carried on funding things um, in, in many different ways, commissioning services or supporting something like the Redeemer Church who um, were putting teas and coffees in the back of their car and going out to um, an estate, West East Estate, to knock on the doors of the most isolated. And some of, sometimes all the funding um, collides. So one of my uh, lockdown trip, trips has been a delightful trip out to an allotment where uh, Rashford is funded through um, some city council funding. Hester's had some initial funding from Aging Better, but they're working with groups of women on, a, on two different allotment projects next to each other and doing some amazing things. It was really joyful when I won stuff, even though it was um, just before lockdown. There were a number of wicked issues that we talked about before, lot, before the pandemic. Absolutely digital exclusion has been, um, there's been a spotlight shone on it because of the pandemic. But um, I know that we'll end up looking again, having to look again at transport as well, because unless we have facilities on every single doorstep, we need transport to get people there. Neighbourhood network schemes are going to be re-procured. So there's a process going on over the next six months to think about how they need to be tweaked and how they need to be changed and how, who else they need to link into. So if anyone wants to um, have a conversation about that or be, um, be involved in that, we can send some information out afterwards, I'm sure. So all of this is moving forward to something that I'm hoping is going to be really positive for the city, which is thinking about all those multiple different domains, all the different issues that might affect all the people and um, how they can move forward. So Birmingham is an age-friendly city, a fulfilling city to age well in. And I know the City Council are looking at this and colleagues from BBSC are also supporting that. So the last thing I want to, to talk about is to really reflect on language and reflect on how all the people are seen in general and um, give some credit to the Centre for Aging Better for the new logo they're going to be launching this month um, for, um, to signify older people and also the new photo library they've got which is more positive images of older people and I know some work's been done with one of the Aging Better like sister projects in Manchester, Ambition for Aging, that have also been developing some photos um, as well but on the same basis. So that's a scoot through of a whole load of different things but I just wanted to, to think about the, the things that are needed in the community and how we make best use of the community to ensure that people's lives are as resilient and as healthy and as long and as happy as they can be. And neighborhood network schemes have had a really good start. Some of them have been going for two years, some of them have only been going for um, 13, 14 months now. But um, it's a lot of work to build on and I think making those wider connections is going to be really positive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Benito. I mean, a really um, inspiring um, kind of set of examples there of how, how the partnership with community organisations, with, with groups working um, in neighbourhoods and localities kind of aligned to the kind of changes Zoe was talking about um, in the way health and social care are working could really make a, a big difference. Lots of comments in the, in the chat, Benita, about how um, impressed people are with um, what you've, you've been describing. To us, and I suspect a fair few people who may well want to know more and, and, and follow up with you. Would anybody at this point like to, to come in and offer a, offer some thoughts or ask um, a question of our panel and perhaps particularly Mustak and Benita? There's always a slight silence at, at that point, isn't it? Zoe, I noticed one of the um, comments in the chat was about intergenerational work. I know you've, you've done something in that space. So perhaps while, while, while people think for a minute or two, would you like to just tell us a little about, a bit about that? Yes, so, um, so I was fortunate enough to, to be part of a, a Channel 4 uh, programme uh, called Old People's Home for Four-Year-Olds. 
and and what we showed there was um you know very attractive for television so some quite cute children um but the impact that their involvement um had on those older adults in terms of mental and physical activity and engagement um were huge and and the thing that worked it was the building relationships it was building friendships um, and then that sense of um, reliance, so not dependency, but you know, having a reason to do things is what led to that being successful. There's been an awful lot in this um, go on in, in Birmingham particularly. So um, almost as soon as it finished, um, colleagues from the, the local authority spoke to me about it and um, uh, have basically set up a network um, because where this works well, it's the schools and the nurseries wanting to do it and the older people's accommodation wanting to do it. So almost a matchmaking network um, was set up. So connecting schools, connecting care homes um, and allowing them, you know, giving advice, uh, reassurance that actually legislation doesn't stop this being happening and enabling it, it to go on. And pre-COVID, some absolutely brilliant projects and, and, and those sort of long lasting, meaningful relationships being built. I think there's a bigger scope for this as well. I'm, I would have been particularly interested in seeing if we could develop this perhaps um, with um, cared for children. Um, maybe younger, sorry, um, sort of older, older young people who haven't necessarily got that network and family support and possibly younger, older people, um, maybe more recently retired, um, you know, and I think there's a real scope there. And again, it, it's all about building relationships, um, you know, a reason, a reason for doing for, for both ages. So, um, yeah, fully supportive of anything, just basically getting communities back rather than living in the silos that it's so easy to for everybody to just descend into. I may of course come back to some of the conversations about housing and housing policy and the role of um, housing as well. And Clive, I can see your hand is up if you'd like to come in. Thank you, Richard. Um, yeah, a, a couple of, of, of quick points. First of all, uh, within the Lunar Society, we have very much been discussing about looking about social care for the future and, and trying to make sure we um, bring people together to talk about it on a holistic basis, because all the way through today, which has been brilliant from all the speakers, um, the underlying thought is unless we have an holistic approach, we're not really going to go forward as, as fast as we can or should. Um, and I'm also very sympathetic to um, reinventing the wheel, which we seem to have done on a number of these subjects and how we make sure that we don't reinvent the wheel yet again is going to be very important of all this. Um, one very final point, um, wearing, another hat, wearing another hat, I'm a deputy lieutenant of the county. And a number of the points that have just been raised strikes me that some of the voluntary groups could well do with raising their um, the recognition of the work they do. And there's something called the Queen's Award of Voluntary Service, which is the equivalent of an MBE for voluntary groups. And if anybody would like to contact me, they can do it by the Lunar Society. I'd be happy to give some advice as far as that's concerned. Thank you, Richard. Much, Clive. I don't know, Benita, whether there's anything you'd like to, um, to, to kind of contribute in, in response to, to the, that point. I've already sent Benita a direct uh, on the chat. I'm still catching up with the chat. Thank you very much. But yes, there's some amazing work being done by the third sector. And I think one of the things that MNS is doing is helping them feel more connected to each other and also helping them link into social prescribing, link workers and so on to improve the way the system's working. Thank you very much. Is there any anybody else who'd like to like to come in? I mean, if not, I wonder if, if Mustak, I might ask you to. One of the things lots of people have said is it's really important to join services up and to get services working well together. From your experiences as as, um, as someone who, who uses some of the services we're we're talking about. What would your reflection on that be? Yeah, I think it's uh, working together because if we if we don't STP, the government already passed the legislation. Legislation, you have to collaborate together to work us together. Either we work together, write our own script, how we 
wanted our, uh, our elderly people or our community to be treated. Otherwise, we'll miss the bus. So working together. I think what Clive uh, said about holistic uh, uh, way of dealing, in elderly people in Scandinavia, they bring children to care home and people's eyes lights up and they're engaging because they're so sad with their own numb feeling. And these are the things in Japan they do differently. They use their grandfather to, to have a care for their own grandchildren where they love to teach. As elder people, they don't have a voice. Whoever shout the loudest, they get heard. Elder people, even in a hospital, you could be laying, could be last one to get bathed. Whoever shout might get attention. So these are the point uh, uh, we need to, and, uh, and if we use elderly people, a lot of people got a lot of skill, technical skill, fixing things. They can teach a lot of young people how to fix things. They got skilled out of amazing, you know, they can do, if they use elderly people. It's an important reminders about the kind of I think it was, as I said breaking down the silos. We don't we don't want kind of ghettos of young people and ghettos of old people. We need communities that can um, support each other. Um, if your hand is up, if you'd like to come in. Don't I don't want to be seen. I know I was on mute. <laughs> so, um, I you know I think that uh, certainly we we must have. Uh, a holistic um, multi-agency approach, which is absolutely right and proper. Um, and I, but I think back to my days very, very long ago where I was involved in, um, in being engaged with mental health um, trusts um, and the legalities that sometimes patients had difficulty in accessing legal advice and support. Um, and then there are also the issues around confidentiality and flows of information and such like. And the, the legal sector is not a sector that's an obvious sector that should be part of that joined up approach. But I think that it would be useful to, to have the, um, the less obvious sectors engaged in, in process as well. So I don't know how the panel feels about that or, and how that, what their experience is of engaging with those less obvious sectors. Question. I mean, Danielle, you, you started to talk a bit about housing and the role of housing in this. Would, would, would you be willing to go first and, and, and build on that thought a bit? Um, yeah, so, I, although I don't think that housing is, is possibly what Deirdre is referring to, because I think I think the case for housing and health working together is already made. Um, I think it's just something we just need to to make happen where it's not happening because you know even from the point of view that you know large social landlords and I am focusing on the social landlords really but large social landlords you know have got direct contact with um, with communities and, and it just makes sense to, to capitalize on that. Uh, and uh, and some real uh, shared objectives about improving the quality of lives uh, of residents because you know, that that's part of their social purpose and it makes good business sense because uh, if people have got good positive healthy lives um, you know that makes tenancies more sustainable so it's a, it's it's a, it's just a win win but Deirdre you were talking about the legal sector and that, that that's really got me thinking because. Um, you know, with my uh, hats on as, as an NHS chair and as a housing association chair, the one thing that I, I've seen happens quite a lot is that you get experts, legal, um, uh, you get expert legal companies in both sectors um, doing very detailed briefings about the very things that we're talking about. So obviously they are already halfway the, halfway there, because they need to understand the sector to be able to win business and to be able to support the sector appropriately. So 
I don't think it's a bad idea, actually, Deirdre. I think we, we, we could actually consider how they could support, even if it was simply about um, facilitating um, discussions and contributing their knowledge would be a starting point. Sorry to put you on the spot on that one, but thank you for um, rising to, to the uh, to Deirdre's challenge. It's something we can we can think through. I can see um, Sandy has his hand up. Um, Sandy, yeah, I, I've made a few points in, in the chat, and I just wanted to bring up a couple. Coming back to the housing issue, um, the government's got up uh, just been consulting on major changes to the planning system. Um, and basically, it's about giving much more power to house builders to deliver what the government sees as its housing targets. The problem there is that house builders are only interested in building their own standard housing model. You know, small apartments, the traditional uh, housing boxes. There's no real provision uh, for any form of social housing or affordable housing for them to be built. And instead, the developers go out of the way to get out of even the pathetic small amount of affordable housing to be provided. And I think there's some, the changes to the planning system that are going to be made could have a significant effect on housing and health in the future. Um, so there does need to be some attention paid to that. And that links into to my second point really, which I was making is a general one. It's obviously a political one, but Government keeps interfering in anything to do with health at, at the national level because they work with their favourite think tanks. And the trouble is all the work we've heard tonight is about local joint working. And that shows the, the benefits of working locally, but it always gets upended by national ministers saying, we've got to change the system. And I think it's, you know, how do we get away from this top-down thinking and allow local communities to determine their own local future? I can see a couple of the hands up, Sam, so I'll bring folks in before we take some points. But I think part of kind of the job, the job of those of us in the system is to, you know, I've never careful, I should say this, shouldn't I, to, to kind of enable all that national stuff to happen in a way that doesn't affect building some really good, strong local relationships that improve things on the ground whatever is going on in that in, in that world so I, I hope we can um, continue to do that i can see um david has his, has his hand up as does amrick so um I'll, I'll perhaps bring you both in david first yes thank you i want to make some comments about the housing problem and i think that the housing problem is because the government and in fact successive governments have failed to understand the problem of the housing market at present there isn't sufficient competition in the housing market. It doesn't allow local contractors to get involved. And as a result, the national developers retain control. They have absolutely no interest in building sufficient houses to see prices to come down. And of course, when you have a housing, a new housing estate, a proportion of that housing estate, usually something like 30%, is actually allocated for what's called affordable housing. Now, where I live, I think north of Birmingham, in Litchfield actually, that definition is 70% of the average house value. But if you're in an area which has a very high house value, that means to say the affordable house is going to be expensive. But having said that, what we need to do is to give uh, local contractors much more um, piece of the action, the chance to compete. And I'll give you an example why it doesn't work. If you designate a large area for a new housing development, say 250 houses, what that usually is, is a greenfield site. It's usually a big field. And one thing that the local contractors cannot do is to start work in a big field. They need infrastructure of, of water, electricity to power their machines and so on, and they need roads. So it means that the only person that can actually start is a big developer who can afford to develop the entire site, put in the roads and the infrastructure of uh, drainage of the utilities. And that's why they have this dominant position. And although the government says, we want to give contractors, uh, local contractors a more piece of the action, and that's actually was in the latest 
white paper on housing, they have misunderstood this basic problem. And you can see this by examples on the continent. In, for example, in Germany, the only authority that is able to develop uh, agricultural land is the local authority. And what they do is they buy the piece of land, they put in the infrastructure, they design the site where the houses are going to be all the different plots, the reserve spaces for social things like community halls, for GP practices and so on, and schools. And then they put in the infrastructure and then they sell off the individual plots. So a national developer can buy some plots, but so can a local individual. A local contractor can buy, say, 10 plots on a piece of land. And until the government begins to understand and even look to other nations to see how it's done and how do they make it work, we will never solve this housing problem. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, David. Um, and Amrik, would you like to come in? Thank you very much, Richard. Amrik Yubi from the Nishkam Centre. And it's been a pleasure to listen to all the speakers this evening. Uh, absolutely amazing contributions. From an elder's point of view, we've got to change our narrative. The elders should not be seen as a liability on society. Serving them with compassion and humility is not just a duty, it's a privilege for the next generation. We have a moral obligation to make sure that that generation is served with that compassion, that humility. There are some great examples of some local solutions in collaboration, working together. But I think what we've heard this evening, I know uh, the term reinvent the wheel was mentioned. We've got to keep stop going around the same wheel. We've been here before, and I know some colleagues have raised it in the chat. How many times do we keep going to the same watering well and making the same mistakes and being overruled by national policy? If something is working, why not nurture it and grow it rather than pour water over it and, and drown it out? Because we're very good at doing that because it depends on whether something is flavor of the month, whether the CCG wants to do it, who's in the CCG chair at the time and who actually wants to sponsor it or not. It shouldn't be about sponsorship. It should be about what is working and what do we want to give legs to. It's about innovation. COVID-19 has exposed some deep-rooted inequalities. This is a prime opportunity for us to review, take stock, reset and recalibrate what we want our community and our society look like. If we come out of this and go back to, or try going back to business as usual because our priorities are elsewhere, we'd have missed a, a prime opportunity. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. and. and um with one eye on the time and, and, and also wondering how, how anyone would follow the passion that you've just given us that, that message with Amrik. I'll, I'll um, perhaps use that point to try and draw a few threads from the discussion. I mean, firstly, thank you very much to everyone who has taken part, um, Benita, Mustak, Danielle and Zoe and everyone who's contributed in the chat and, and um, by joining in. I think it's been a really um, kind of useful, insightful discussion, and, and thank you to the Lunar Society for arranging it. Um, you know, clearly this is an issue that really matters, and it matters in in a city like Birmingham, um, perhaps more so than in many other places as well, for all those reasons of inequality um, that we have been discussing, and and all those things that the pandemic has brought to the fore. I mean, I, to, to pull out perhaps just four quick themes, we we've clearly talked a lot about. Um, the importance of, of understanding what it is like to use the services and working with the citizens who use um, services and who need services. And that kind of seems to be an important theme. Um, and, and Mustak in particular reminded us of the importance of that. The idea that services need to be holistic, need to be joined up, need to be delivered in and, and alongside and with communities in the way Benita was describing to us, I think feels like another really uh, powerful message. Um, I, I know we didn't invite Danielle here because she also chairs a social housing provider, but, but housing and, and the role of housing and health um, for older people has come out very strongly from the, um, from, from the conversation and as has, I think, the notion of digital and the importance of ensuring that kind of we use technology to the full, but use it in a way that means everybody um, can use it. And I think that's how we can try to make sure we, we have a city in which people can age well and a set of health and social care services that do indeed kind of work for 
um, everyone in the city. So thank you everybody very much for um, a, a really instructive, insightful and, and um, I hope inspiring conversation. And I think at this point, Peter, I'm due to hand back to you. Um, thank you. Um, I think Peter Mayer would have would want to say a few words. Um, he has been instrumental in organising this um, very successful meeting, um, and I'll pass you over to Peter Mayer. Yes, I've been given a minute, so I, I've come away with working together. Um, Zoe's talked about children. I remember my former prof doing a paper on how good cats are in care homes and improving mood, and, and socialisation is so important. I'd particularly like to thank the Lunar Society for allowing the Institute of Ageing and Health to, to partner with it. And in particular, the person we haven't seen tonight, David Clark. And da David is the administrator of the society and manages the technology, which I think has mostly gone really well. So, so that's super. I'll just mention one thing. No one's mentioned the word vaccines, but I think actually, What's the rollout of vaccines in Birmingham has been a really good example of people working across the whole sector. And since AstraZeneca yesterday showed a trial result, which is that the first dose does actually last for 12 weeks and does help older people, is a really important piece of knowledge for us to have received. I'd also just lastly say what the boards the, the sectors haven't mentioned is that they do have public board meetings and it is on their websites and there is a lot of knowledge there and I'd lastly say Benita that was wonderful because the third sector should be in all these discussions at the top end and BVSC has become a, a major organisation within here and Mustak as everyone said that was super it's really important to understand people's needs. Uh, and so thank you. And I hand back to the person I want to thank most because the chair, uh, the overall chair, Peter hasn't said he's a general practitioner. Well, I think he did. He mentioned he was a general practitioner by background, still doing a bit of work. Uh, and so that's the other half or the other bit of the jigsaw that works together. So again, thank you everybody who's participated and the discussion I know was just getting going. Thank you Peter, I can hear your clock chiming there so um, it is eight o'clock. Um, <laughs> just, just a few quick words but um, I mean I, I we're not sort of um, praising each other here but I would say that a lot of the stuff that I practiced as a GP um, really uh, was taught by you Peter and, uh, and, and I, I, I cherished working with you so many years back, way back in 1981. Um, having said that, um, I think this, this evening's meeting has been uh, brilliant. I've, I've, I've really enjoyed it. And I kept quiet on purpose because although I'm a retired GP and I have a lot of, of, a lot of um, anecdotes I can come back to you on with uh, sort of disjointed working and such like, I think the idea of um, unified um, holistic working is certainly the way to go. Um, I, I, again, the, the, the experience I have has very often been very good, but sometimes things have broken down and we've ended up with uh, patients who have not been particularly very happy. Um, having said that, um, I would like to thank all the um, panel members here. There's Richard, who very ably um, chaired the whole discussion. Um, Zoe, who gave us a very good insight into what um, uh, good, good working practices should be in a way, and the fact that she has obviously been involved in um, a lot of integration of um, health services. Um, Danielle gave us a very good um, rundown on how mental health can be a very important issue, and in fact many other um, topics that can uh, influence uh, the, the uh, care of the aging in particular. Um, Mustak obviously did in fact emphasize that also, but very much from a personal perspective. And he was very um, open about um, his own um, 
um, path, pa uh, passage through life in a way. Benita, on the other hand, um, propounded quite a lot of what went on with the uh, third sector and obviously the initiatives that are currently um, um, existing and, and certainly show the path forward, I think. Anyway, but, but apart from that, I mean, we will be uh, generating a summary document, uh, which will be available on the uh, Lunar Society website um, in the newsletter, which should be coming out towards the beginning of next month. Um, again, I'd like to thank David, David Clark, who was very ably uh, managing all the buttons and, uh, and, and making sure that we're, we're still live at this stage. Um, all the participants, there's been a massive response. You know, we were at one stage 52 participants, and I think that's an amazing turnout. That generated a lot of discussion, which um, I think uh, shows how important the subject is to all of us and to um, the uh, general uh, well being of everybody. Um, in the Lunar Society, we always welcome new members. We are obviously keen to welcome as many people as possible for very similar discussions to what we're having now on all sorts of subjects. And I think our basic motto is that we stimulate debate, we broaden, uh, sorry, we stimulate ideas, we broaden debate and catalyze action. And I think that is really um, our uh, major drive in society at this stage. So I think with that, um, I would, close the meeting. I hope you've all enjoyed yourselves. I know you don't have very far to travel, any of you, as it were, but I'll finish with one statement that Zoe made, which was that good care is the cheaper care. Obviously, the converse of that is, is that bad care is much more expensive. I think uh, that is a very important point to drive home. But thank you very much all, and uh, safe journey to wherever your lounge is, and your gin and tonic. Thank you very much. Good night. Well done, Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, what an excellent, ec Richard, well done as well. What an excellent, excellent uh, evening. It really was good. I, I, I think it was brilliant. We, we had so, so much interaction, partly on the chat facility and partly on the, uh, you know, obviously in the discussion that we had. And I, I stayed quiet because I really felt that the flow was so good. I thought David had just muted you. <laughs> well, he could have, he might well have, and, and to be honest with you, he, he, it was well within his uh, capacity to do to do so. No, seriously, it was it was good. Yeah, anyway, it was fantastic, and and definitely thank you so much. Uh, thank you. The lieutenancy is becoming much more known now within our circles than it than it was. <laughs> I, I have to give an apology. I cannot resist an opportunity, mind you, with the voluntary services. They are so shy in coming forward. It really is not good. Anyway, okay. good night, everybody. I'm going to have my supper. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank, good night. Thank, you. Thank you, Peter. It was a fantastic, excellent, excellent event. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Law. Just Sorry, what was that, Rosie? Your comment about including the law just, yes. just reminded me that when I go and see a lawyer, they call me Mrs. Mayor. When I go to a National Health Service facility and I'm vulnerable, they call me lovey or <gasps> or uh, my, my darling or something. Uh, that tells a huge tale in itself, I think. I could have had a whole meeting on that. So thank you <laughs> for adding that in. <laughs> You're very welcome. You're very welcome. I just hope that Peter doesn't get jealous if... Um, the person who's calling you lovey or darling. It's a, is, it's uh, <laughs> but, but no one could be as good looking as Peter anyway. So no one could sway you. Another session. Yes. We all in society. For each other. Yeah, yeah. It, it just brought it home to me. It was quite funny. Quite funny. <laughs>
Oh, have a lovely evening, all. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Take care. Bye bye. Right. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Deirdre, for encouraging us to go ahead with it. No, no, no. It's, it's not a problem at all. <laughs> you, you are my inspirations. So uh, you're, the, you're my rocket fuel. Rose is my inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> I need a Rosie in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Take good care. Yes, yeah, so bye. bye. bye.